I'm Tamara, and this is TELUS Talks with Tamara Taggart. We're bringing together experts, thinkers, and leaders, busting myths, sharing stories, and staying connected when Canadians need it the most. We're having unexpected conversations for unprecedented times. Hi, Dr. Henry. Thank you so much for taking some time to uh, talk to us today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Okay, so I um, I have been reading your book, uh, Soap and Water and Common Sense. I bought it for ten dollars uh, on uh, on my iPad, and uh, it's it's been great. I've actually uh, learned a lot about viruses and bacteria. Uh, I, I only wish I would have read this a long time ago. Uh, so you've been studying the transmission of diseases for decades, and you know it was really interesting to hear what you had to say uh, in your book about SARS and Ebola and AIDS. Uh, and now we're dealing with COVID-19. It, you know, how is this virus different than other ones that that you have been working with or tracking down? Well, it, I mean, it's a virus. And so it does behave like a lot of other viruses, but each of them has its unique characteristics. And when I think of this one, when it first came out, having had experience with SARS, you know, my first concern was that it was going to be as, as deadly as SARS was. And and then my second concern was, is it going to spread more easily or less easily? And so really, what we've come to learn over the last few months is that it is a virus that is spread through respiratory droplets in the same way that other coronaviruses are and influenza and SARS. Um, it's not as lethal as SARS was, which is a good thing, but it's far more infectious. And it's not as infectious as influenza, for example. Uh, it doesn't spread quite as easily as influenza, but it's far more lethal than influenza. So it is, it's a very challenging virus to, to contain and to manage. Did you, I mean, this is your home province, and now you're, you're in charge of all of our, you know, our safety when it comes to this virus. Um, I, I don't think, could you have imagined this happening? I, it's I, I, sort of. Um, I've spent a lot of time working on, on pandemic influenza planning, and we've talked about things, uh, scenarios, and we have a, a Canadian pandemic influenza plan, and it has these scenarios. And one of the scenarios is just this. But, you know, we did this thinking of influenza. And so um, the nice thing about influenza is we have a well-established mechanism for developing vaccines. We have some treatments. And that is the biggest challenge with this virus. So it, while we thought we might have to do what we call social distancing measures or public health measures, non-pharmaceutical interventions, we have all these fancy names for them. I, I didn't ever really think that I would have to impose things like travel restrictions and cancelling in-classroom schooling and, um, you know, the whole really important distancing that we're doing and the impact it's having on our, our entire um, society and, of course, on economies and society around the world. It, it, um, it, it was and is, continues to be very surreal in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, surreal is how I've been describing it for me. Uh, uh, as a parent and, you know, somebody who needs to earn a living. And, and you're right, it is affecting everybody in different ways. But for people that don't understand what your exact role is, I mean, so you are the one that you're making the calls. You're saying schools need to shut down. You're saying, you know, no parks are open. Like, so maybe you can explain to somebody who isn't quite clear on what your responsibility is. Well, I have to say it's it's not just me, as we always <laughs> say in public health. It's a team sport. Um, so there are many wise people that uh, um, advise me. Um, we work on these things together. We look at the data. We look at the science behind it. And, um, you know, I have to say there are some very strong leaders in our health care system as well who have been very involved in this. And, um, and so it's my advice in some ways, uh, in some instances, and it is direction in others. So I'm the 
provincial health officer here in British Columbia. Across Canada, we call them different things, but it's essentially the chief medical officer of health. So it's not a political position or a, um, an appointed position. It is something that is um, held by, you have to have a medical degree, you have to have experience. And my predecessor, Dr. Perry Kendall, was in this job for, for many years, and I learned tremendous amounts from him. And then when he retired, uh, I was uh, appointed to the position um, based on my experience and who I was. But um, it, it, it is... Um, it is a challenging because we have a. Uh, I have an independent reporting role to the public on the health of the population, and it is uh, there's a piece of legislation in in BC. It's called the Public Health Act, but it's the same across the country. Each province has a, a, a public health act that gives me authorities to do take specific actions, but all to protect the health of the public. So it needs to be an action that is um, that is going to make a difference and that. It has evidence behind it. So yes, I, I have been providing to the advice to government about the things we need to do around the health care system. And some of it is orders that I have given provincially to uh, enact certain parts of the response um, that I think are necessary things that we need to do um, to stop the transmission of this virus. So, I mean, you are juggling a lot and uh, your team, uh, how many people are on your team would you say like about? Well, I have a very small office to be honest, but uh, um, the, so there's just, uh, there's uh, myself and, and two other physicians in this office um, and uh, we're all of course working full time on this now. Yeah. Uh, we have a strong public health system in the province. And so there's the chief medical health officers in each of the regional health authorities and the medical health officers, the public health nurses, public health inspectors mm -hmm. that we have across the province. Um, we're a small but mighty team, I think. Yes, and you are. Been doing a ton of work. Absolutely. But we also... We also have a very strong um, health system uh, group that has been involved with this. And I can't say enough about the deputy minister, Stephen Brown, who's been um, the lead architect of the health system response and making sure we get everything organized um, across mm -hmm. uh, the health sector. And it involves everybody from the yeah, CEOs. To, yeah. So what about, from, let's talk a little bit just about if we can go back to basics, because uh, I, I know that you're also learning about there's so much information coming in daily and we're learning from other countries and other people that are experiencing this at the same time as us. Let's go back to the symptoms. What are the symptoms of COVID-19? So this is a respiratory virus, which means it causes the same sort of things that we see with uh, influenza, with the common cold. So cough, Shortness of breath, fever is an important part. Um, uh, and we also see some of the sort of milder symptoms like uh, sore throat, runny eyes, runny nose that sometimes happen with uh, more on the common cold side, which makes it really tricky because it's very difficult, particularly in January, February, March, where we have a lot of other viruses circulating that cause these symptoms. It's really difficult to tell which is which. And especially early on, uh, we know that particularly young, healthy people can have very mild symptoms with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. There is also um, in some people um, uh, muscle aches and fatigue as well. And uh, in a small number of people, particularly younger people, they may also have uh, diarrhea as a, as a symptom of, of COVID-19. Right. So it's basically everything that we're used to having yeah. if we have a flu or a cold. So hard to tell. Exactly. Um, there's a lot of talk about testing and why aren't we testing everybody and we should just be testing every single person so we know. What's your response to that? Yeah, so the testing is incredibly important and how we use the testing is incredibly important. So it takes time to develop the test and we're lucky here in BC and in Canada, we've had tests available since January um, and our lab at the VCCDC has been amazing. Um, it takes time to ramp that up. Part of the challenges we have are the global supply for the, 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 the it's, not as, it, it's not just as easy as turning on a light switch and knowing yes or no. Um, there's the, what we call reagents. So the solutions that things have to be in, there's um, the machines that need to be run. So anyway, it takes time to, to get all that. And we ramped up very quickly. We had a very low threshold for testing for a number of weeks. But once you start getting um, transmission in the community, it's really more 
more about knowing where the outbreaks are, knowing where the health system is being affected, getting a sense of who needs to be in hospital and making sure people in hospital are identified quickly and early. So we switched our strategy to focus on where we needed to understand what was happening. But we didn't stop all of the community testing at all. We continued that. So we had a, a broader understanding, what we call surveillance of, you know, how it was moving in our community. And now we're at the point where we're looking at switching back again and expanding who we're testing. So early on, it was really important to know um, that it was being introduced from other countries, particularly from China at the start. And then we knew Iran. Um, and now, of course, Europe and the United States was a large introductions from the United States. So it was really important for us to understand where it was coming from. Now we know that it's in most countries in the world. So travelers, we need them to self-isolate and to, uh, if they have symptoms, um, and to stay away from others. So the, the, the action that we'll take is to, for them to stay away from others, to break those transmission chains. If they need to come in hospital, then absolutely we may, we will test them. The other thing though that's really important about this test, it's not a hundred percent. So it has what we call false positives. So it can't always tell if you have the virus and it has false negatives which is also a really important thing. And we've learned that the false negative rate, so the ability to, of the test to detect if you actually have this virus is actually not as good as we need it to be. So it, it's, it can't always tell early on in particular if you have the virus or not. The other thing that is really important is when somebody doesn't have any symptoms, the test is not very good. It's not valid at all. So going around and just testing everybody is not going to help us because you might be negative right now, but you might develop symptoms in a few hours and it could be related to this. So what's the COVID. best thing that we can all do? Yeah, so that's why we've put in place these really sweeping things. The best thing that we can do, all of us need to do right now, because we know this is in our community, is to put that distance between us. This is a this is a respiratory virus, so it gets in droplets when we cough, when we um, sneeze. You know, there's been a lot of talk about um, people um, spreading it before they have symptoms or when they don't have any symptoms at all. And for the most part, though, we know that um, particularly from what we've looked at here, where we do detailed investigations on every single case, it's when you have symptoms and when you're close to somebody that you're going to be transmitting this. So that's how we stop the transmission. Because we don't have a treatment and because we don't have a vaccine, we need to put that safe distance between us to stop us from passing it on to others. Mm -hmm. So we're staying home if we can. Uh, we're we're self-isolating. We are uh, staying two meters away from people. Uh, most of us are. <laughs> um, and your hands. Cleaning and washing our hands, our hands, really hands really washing our hands, washing our hands. Is it important to even do that at home if you're not, if you're self-isolating to continue to wash your hands? Absolutely. Uh, it's um, to protect those around you if you happen to have this. But it, it's more, it's important for everything that we do. And one of the reasons we, we talk so much about washing your hands and people get very concerned that, you know, if I touch something, I'm going to get infected with this. You don't get sick from this virus by having it on your hands. When you get sick from this virus is when you put your hands to your face, particularly your eyes or your nose, and the virus can um, can then um, get into your nasal passages, the mucous membranes that have those receptors that allow mm -hmm. the virus to get. In. So that's why we need to be fastidious about cleaning our hands all the time. So you're not going to get it from touching the newspaper or from touching money or from touching things out in the you know the, right. the bus railing or the elevator. I think we're button. all we're all yeah. figuring out how much we actually do touch our faces because exactly. we've now been told not to touch them and we touch them all the time. So this is uh, we have a long weekend coming up. Uh, I can't imagine that people would travel for fun this weekend uh, with with everything that's happening. Uh, I just I want to I want to know about you know travel restrictions. Uh, for this weekend for people? And also, you know, why aren't we just doing a full down two week lockdown? Like everything mm -hmm. is done for two weeks. Well, you know, we are essentially doing that. But I think there's some really important balance we need to have in there. So for this weekend, absolutely. 
stay close to home, stay with your family. You know, there's a number of religious celebrations coming up. Do it online, connect with people that you may not have connected with before. Find a way to, to have that community, but in a way that keeps the safe distance between us. And it really is about protecting our family, our friends. As I said, this is transmitted to people who, who you have close contact with, who you're indoors with, um, who you're spending time with. And we want to protect those people the most, particularly our elders and seniors. And I can't say enough about how important they are in our lives. And there are you know, the keepers of the memories and, the, and in many cases, the keepers of culture and language that we need to protect. So this is a good weekend to just connect, to think about those things, to think about your family, to think about your community, not to go traveling to um, summer cottages or homes on the Gulf Islands. Or, you know, our, our concern is we spent a lot of time protecting our health care system. But if we start um, going and inadvertently take this to a small community where there may not be the resources to look after you or to care for the people if they get sick, then we're, we're going to un do all the important things that we've done. Mm -hmm. So now's the time to stay close and to stay home. Mm -hmm. I will say, though, that I think we need to find that balance. We need to make sure that people are able to get food, that they are able to get their medications, that you can um, fix your furnace if it breaks. And, you know, there's things that our garbage is picked up. Really, um, if, we, if we lost the internet, we'd be in big trouble. Mm -hmm, <laughs> so mm -hmm. making sure have all of those key things that allow us to continue to to function because this is it is has been weeks and it will be weeks more before we can get back to our usual. Yeah, but I also so, think yeah, to, sorry, to, to have we balance. need to have the the balance and the mental health balance. We know the risk is less when you're outdoors. This virus doesn't spread as well outdoors as most respiratory viruses are. Uh, don't spread as well outdoors. So I do think it's important for all of our sanity mm -hmm. to be able to get out, um, to experience it, but to keep our distance from people, be respectful. It's not going out in groups and talking and because then we're getting close to each other again mm -hmm. and we can spread the virus. And then we can take it back to our family or to our elders or to right. people who are, are, are staying at home. But go out with your family, go for a walk, go for a bike ride, stay away from others, enjoy the, the the sun and, mm -hmm. and the beauty that we still have here. So, you know, how uh, you, you mentioned uh, it will be weeks more. When do you see life going back to normal? Do you see uh -huh. it yet? Do you see the end or are you not there yet? I, I think we have to def rethink about what normal is going to be for a while. And, it, you know, it's hard to fathom this. But this is a virus that is um, really lethal to older people, but we also know it's lethal to young people as well. And we've seen people in, um, in their 20s and 30s who are severely affected by this. We unfortunately had a, a tragic death in somebody in their 40s. So these are, these are very real concerns. And we aren't going to be able to go back to the way things were a few months ago um, for the near future until we get enough immunity in our community. And that can either be because people have been infected and we want to do that slowly over time so that we're not overwhelming our system and we're protecting our uh, the people who are more likely to have severe illness or until we have a vaccine. I'm, and, you know, the vaccine, there's a lot of work been um, going on around the world to try and develop a vaccine and, and that'll be really important. I do think and I hope that we're going to get a bit of a reprieve and we're looking right now about, okay, well, what do we do to allow us to get to back to some semblance of normalcy um, with still being able to protect people and monitor in case this flares up again? And so those are the, the questions that are um, that we're all tackling right, right now. How do we do that in a way that protects people still? And if there, you know, when, uh, when there is a vaccine, um, how how do you see that going? Is that is that something where a vaccine's available and it will be voluntary to get it, or a vaccine's available is a mass vaccination? It's mandatory. I mean, I still have my smallpox, you know, vaccination from that I got when I was one. So is yeah. is it similar, or are, are, is this a whole different beast? 
You know, I, I, I think we, I do not believe in mandatory immunization. I think um, it, most people will be wanting a vaccine to protect themselves, but also to protect their families and to protect the seniors in their lives. Because even though most of us, um, you know, particularly younger people, most of them will have a very mild illness with this. It's those around us, our families and our communities that we need to protect as well. So uh, I see this rolling out as a voluntary program, but a mass immunization program that as many people as possible get the vaccine as soon as they can. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are we flattening mm -hmm. the curve? Uh, I... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, we are. The work that we are doing, what everybody is doing, is making a huge difference for us. We are still seeing people in coming into hospital. We are still seeing people becoming quite ill with this in our intensive care units. And tragically, people are still dying from this here in BC. So we are making a difference, but we cannot let up now because we're in the middle of it right now and we need to be really mindful of what's going on around us you know the united states is still going through a a, a lot of illness and particularly in in some of um the the, the larger cities in the eastern part and mid-east and washington state continues to have cases we continue to have cases we continue to watch what's happening in in ontario and quebec so we are by no means through this right now but now's our time to, to, to continue to hold the line, um, to continue to have patience with each other, to have compassion, to be kind with those people who are helping us out when they make us stand in a lineup for mm -hmm. six feet apart. Um, you know, we all need to just take a deep breath and know that we're going to get through this. Um, but it's going to be some time now. And now's the time not to... Uh, uh, what to continue to bend the curve and not bend the rules. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, a couple of things. Uh, when it comes to masks, a lot of talk mm -hmm. about masks. And, uh, you know, uh, there's been some criticism of, uh, of Dr. Tam and uh, which, I mean, it's, I, you know, we're learning, we're learning as we go, you're learning as you go this uh, and, and, and there's this big debate, I guess, if you will, about masks and whether to wear them or not wear them. Uh, where are we at with masks in BC? Yeah, we, you know, as you say, we're learning as we go. And we know that um, medical masks in the community are, are really a no-go right now. We need to con keep medical masks and particularly what we call respirators or the N95 uh, respirators. We need those in our healthcare system. And there is still a global shortage of these uh, really important personal protective equipment in the healthcare system. So all of us are, are unequivocal on that. No medical masks in the community. Where um, things have changed a little bit is more evidence that there may be transmission um, from people, again, in close settings. Um, when um, before, early on when I have symptoms or in the days of the day before I, I start to have symptoms and that some people in particular have a very high viral load. So a lot of virus in their saliva just before they get um, symptoms. And there's no way to tell which person is that person and which person isn't going to ha shed the virus until they're, they definitely have a cough. So uh, what has uh, the sort of consensus, I guess, is that it probably doesn't hurt to wear a non-medical mask if you need to be out in the community and for short periods of time may not be able to maintain our six foot distance between people or one to two meters between people. So if you need to go on transportation to go to work, if you're at the grocery store and you may be passing somebody, it's a way of keeping your droplets in. So it's not going to protect you from getting it. As far as we know, there's no evidence it'll protect you from um, somebody else coughing in your face. <laughs> um, but, you know, we hope that people aren't doing that as well. But it does keep your droplets from um, from spreading out and from getting uh, contaminating surfaces. And if people aren't as good at washing their hands, for example. So I liken it to covering your cough, like using a tissue and cleaning your hands or coughing into your elbow um, for short periods of time. If you need to be out or be in contact with others, um, then wearing a non-medical cloth mask um, can probably help keep your droplets in. Right, right. In your in your book, you um, you said something that really um, uh, 
it's, it's really stuck with me. It's a complacency mm-hmm. can be costly and deadly. Uh, yeah. And I mean, it's true. So were, were, were we complacent? I mean, I feel like I was. Uh, I I never imagined in my day to day life that this would be happening right now in in BC and Canada around the world, um, and you know yes I'm aware of SARS and H1N1 and AIDS and and uh, you know all all the ones in history that we know about too, but none of it seemed real to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so were people were were. I'm not talking about you being complacent, scientists being complacent, but do you think that worldwide we were complacent about this virus or other viruses? I, I think yes and no. Um, it is so challenging. And having lived through Ebola and SARS, and it, it, you know, it does strike that sense of fear in people. But then, you know, we do get a little complacent. There was a lot of talk around hand hygiene, around um, building up our capacity to manage um, o- outbreaks of new viruses and, and pandemics after the SARS outbreak. And, you know, public health had been, it's, it's easy when, when you have um, the tyranny of the urgent with all the, the needs in our healthcare system to uh, whittle away at prevention. And public health is all about prevention. And yes, we, hit, we got a big boost after SARS, but then it was whittled Way again, and then we had the uh, the H one N one pandemic, and it wasn't as severe as it as other pandemics. Although you know, don't get me wrong, it really did create um, quite a lot of of uh, young people becoming ill. And I often say, if if you know, if the Olympics in um, in Vancouver had been at in November or October of that year, we would have had to cancel or postpone them because all of our um, ICU beds were were full of young people on ventilators because mm. of H one N one. But we, as a global community, it wasn't that bad a pandemic, so we did get a little complacent after that. I think people as well um, got a little complacent about immunization, and that's one of the things that we saw was immunization rates for influenza, but also for things like measles and and whooping cough and all those other um, protections that we had. People um, didn't see these very often, so uh, there was a sense of we don't need those um, protections anymore, and certainly public health and the role that we played we play in the community and keeping thing, people safe and trying to do prevention. So yeah, some of our pandemic stockpiles had right. expired and hadn't been replaced. And so what, it's how do very we learn from this? How do we learn from COVID-19 so that we, we aren't complacent ever again? I can, I mean, as you say, it, it doesn't seem real in many ways that this is happening to us around the world. And I can't imagine that we will reset um, our world to a place where complacency about this type of thing could ever happen, at least in my lifetime. But you you never know. I mean, I thought that after SARS as well, that we had, particularly in, in Canada, a real wake-up call. Um, but there are many things that that overtake that. I I hope that the, some of the positive unintended consequences will will last through this. And there are many things that people are telling me that are are positive that are coming out uh, of us. You know, a sense of uh, of spending time with family, of appreciating um, time in a different way. Um, I, we had a call yesterday with a number of religious leaders uh, of faith communities across the province, and uh, many of them were saying that their their online offerings and connections had dramatically increased the number of people that were involved in, from hundreds to thousands of people who found mm-hmm. um, them online. Right. We can't, you know, the the unintended negative consequences on our economy and on people's health can't be underestimated either. But definitely, I, 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 I you know, I've been thinking. Thing. Yeah, I ha- I have a son with a disability, and mm-hmm. and so people, you know, uh, disabled people are of deep concern for me. Um, and, you know, we mention seniors all the time and, and, and long term resident homes. And, you know, we know people with disabilities, most of them live in poverty. Uh, they're in group homes. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, in, in that community, uh, there's a lot of concern about many things. But do you think that 
I can't help but think myself that poverty is an underlying health condition, really. Um, this is something that we talk about a lot in public health, and we call it the social determinants of health. And probably the biggest determinant is, is poverty. Um, it's education. You know, the, it's the things that you need um, to have as a society. You know, one of the things we talk about are minimum basic income. And there's been some experiments, if you will, in Canada around that, that wax and wane according to political um, will. So I, I hope that we can start looking at what are the things that keep us as a society healthy and how can we support that? And, you know, these are things that we talk about with the overdose crises that we've been living through the last few years, um, the importance of, uh, you know, people who use drugs of, often use it to support themselves through pain, whether that's emotional pain, whether it's pain from, um, you know, not having enough to eat, uh, the childhood that they went through. So all of those things that we do to support people and the more marginalized people in our society are the things that are going to help us through health as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I absolutely agree with you. I think we need to rethink how do we keep people safe? And some of that is around housing, making sure people have access to food. And it's certainly not mm -hmm. lost on me through this crisis that um, food security has become a challenge. People people who um, don't have access to bank cards are, are mm. having difficulty buying food even. Our food banks are challenged to, do, to provide food to people in a way that's safe. And uh, the economic impacts that we're going to be seeing um, in the coming years, we need to recognize and, and support those who are the most disadvantaged are the ones who are going to suffer the most through this crisis as well. Yeah, and I, 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 I knew I knew you felt that way, and I, and it's so good to hear you say that because it gets lost in it gets lost in everything else. There's just so much information out there, and so many opinions, and to uh, to hear your voice, and I mean, uh, you know, to have somebody who is calm and smart and uh, can really. Uh, I mean, it's common sense, right? Your your book. Please read Dr. Henry's <laughs> book. It's so good. Um, so thank you for that. When when do we know this is over? I, I know I asked you that, but I don't like, do we know it's over when the ICUs are empty or do we know it's over? Not over, but I know there's a vaccine, but how do you know when we the, the curve is flattened and enough that we can? Yeah, that just, we can start looking. At. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what things do we start with? Um, mm -hmm. you know, which are the ones? So th there's a couple of things that we, we've been having discussions about this. You know, what are the health pieces that we can get back to doing so that we're protecting those people who don't have COVID? Um, you know, the, the scheduled surgeries, the, the medical appointments that are so important. I think some of that is going to shift, that we're going to have a phase shift in the adoption of virtual care that's going to be a benefit for people. Um, how do we monitor to can how do which businesses is it safer to start opening up again so that we can get the economy going again mm -hmm. because we know that that makes a difference for people's health as well. Um, which are the the things that are uh, less risky, you know? And so we need to look at the evidence about schools and kids coming together and does that amplify it or not? Um, and those are some of the things that we're doing now. What about being outdoors? How much risk is it compared to um, events indoors? How do we best um, manage uh, workplaces uh, to encourage um, continuous um, in distancing, safe distancing. Mm. How do we protect smaller communities? So, yeah, these are all the things we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, there's a lot. How do we monitor travel? Um, because we know that it is still going to be a problem for many weeks to months in other parts of the world and make sure that we can support people to, to self-isolate safely when they come back mm -hmm. to our communities too. Yeah, so those and, are all the questions that we're asking. No kidding. And in your book, you mentioned things, things, um, travel so fast now we're modern you can go from one country to another in a matter of hours and and then the virus moves with you so uh there's so much to think about uh just as we wrap up um how are you taking care of yourself i can't imagine that you have two seconds of time do you sleep at night because i don't and i don't, <laughs> I don't have sleep very you do. much but i know <laughs> 
I, I do lay awake. I worry. I worry about the impacts of the things that we're doing, and it just um, uh, and I worry. You know, I, I worry about young people. I worry about particularly teenagers um, who are at that transitional phase in their life, and and we've just blown everything up. And mm. you know, I worry about uh, kids who send me notes and say, "Do you think it'll be okay to have a real birthday party next month?" And it's like, mm. Mm, maybe not next month. And how how are they going to remember this? And how can we help um, young people with their anxieties uh, that they sense because they know they know enough to know that we're worried? Um, mm-hmm. How do we make it through? Uh, so uh, things that I do, I, I do I do actually meditate. Um, I run and I I go early in the morning and I find it's one of those things that helps me think, um, helps me uh, stay a little bit connected to myself and and the world out there so I took short runs these days but yes. you know, it helps a lot and I connect with family and I'm very lucky I have uh, close sisters I have um, you know family and we've talked in ways and times that we never have before and mm. I, you know appreciate those things and uh, you you have a new uh, forward to your book. I, I, I'm not getting paid to plug your book. I know that. <laughs> but uh, it is very good. But you do have a new forward. And your sister, who's also a doctor, she interviews you. No, she's not a doctor. She's a she's a publisher, actually. Oh, she's I thought a... it said Dr. Henry, too. Well, I just oh. promoted her to a doctor. Um, but she interviews you and and ha- you guys have a really good conversation about uh, COVID because you this is a new forward from March of 2020. So uh, I really appreciated that that sisterly conversation in the book. You know, my sister and I are very close in age, um, although we're completely opposite in many ways. And uh, yeah, she's uh, she's brilliant. Um, she's uh, in publishing. She's the the uh, in uh, anyway. Yeah, she came to spend some time with me during this because uh, I was quite stressed, as you can imagine. So um, it's been wonderful having that connection. And as part of this, she um, when the uh, host of Anansi said they wanted to re-release the book. Book, um, she said, well, let me put together something that would um, give you a sense of what's happening right now. So I was really grateful for her for that. I'm grateful for it, too, because it uh, really helped me wrap my head around everything that's happening right now. I uh, I can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your busy day to talk to us. I really appreciate it. Thank you for everything you do. Uh, my two daughters think you are a superhero. Um, and uh, they're, they're, uh, we, watch, we watch your press conferences, and uh, it's, it's a great way to keep them informed uh, in a scientific way. So thank you for everything you're doing to keep us safe. Uh, I really appreciate your time, Dr. Henry. Oh, thank you. And do you know, thank you. We will get through this, and uh, I can only hope that we'll we'll keep the important things and how we can stay connected with each other and stay calm and be kind to each other, and um, that will help us through. I agree with you 100%. And for the latest medical updates, you can go to bccdc.ca. Thank you for joining us today and be sure to join us here on Telus Talks with Tamara Taggart every Tuesday and Thursday. 